The Transportation Advisory Committee meeting will now begin. The date is October 15th, 2019. Kim, would you please call the roll? Yep. Mr. Anderson? Here. Mr. Atkinson? Here. Mr. LaSalle? Here. Mr. McEnroe? Here. Mr. Jessick? Here. Mr. Lyman? Here. Mr. Tong? Here. Is there any changes or anything in the minutes that need to be discussed? Or I have to speak. I have one. Uh, says was the meeting was called to order by Vice Chair Jessica. Actually, it was me. Oh, I will change that. And then the last page I'd like to have added. Uh, just above item seven. I'd like to add, added Mr. LaSalle asked that Ms. Webb send him information on this regarding crosswalks. Oh, that's a reminder. Mm -hmm. Any other meeting? Any changes? Additions? Subtractions? John? A reminder one on page two. Um, the second bullet, Ms. became Mr. The rest of them are all Ms. Ms. Weber, Ms. Weber. But I'm looking Got at it. it. Anything else? Is there a motion to accept it as amended? I'd make the motion to approve the amendments. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 It passed. <clears throat> The agenda, is there anything about the agenda that we need to move, adjust, or otherwise look at? I hear, I hear nothing. Citizen comment, there's no citizens here that would want to comment, so we'll move on. I, I do have one thing, um, and I, maybe that's next month, but um, I thought we talked about the Malala Avenue and there, you guys were gonna do some analysis on that, the two lanes in front of the um, Safeway. It's, it's hidden under 5C, it's mm. in, under the staff report. Okay. okay. Then uh, the new business, uh, housing code amendments, we, have somebody here who is going to uh, lead us through this, I assume? Yes. Good evening, Chair. Uh, my name is Pete Walter uh, with the Planning Division. Thank you. Could, Pete, could you hold up all this noisy screens? <laughs> <laughs> all right, now that, now that we got a whiteboard, um, I've uh, given versions of this presentation quite a bit, so please uh, ask me questions if you want clarification. I added uh, three slides towards the end, which deal, uh, which summarize this report that we just handed out. The report is from August of 2018 and was prepared by Replinger and Associates, so I just attempted to summarize it the main th main conclusions from that report. Um, and my focus tonight is just to give you an overview of the code amendments that we just adopted. Um, and those code amendments principally have to do with housing. We had a grant from Metro starting in 2016 to look at our zoning code and analyze it to make sure that we were removing barriers to uh, housing types. Um, this has nothing to do with HB 2001. We didn't even know about HB 2001 when we started this process. Um, so just want to put that out there. Um, and, you know, I, I'd be happy to try to chime in on that conversation after we, we're done. So, um, but I'll just give you an overview of what we have done so far. Um, so this all started with uh, some analysis based on the housing choices in the city. Um, most of our housing is single family residential, very similar to most cities in the region, uh, about 70% of it, and the rest is dispersed among the housing types you can see here. 
with the majority of the other types of housing in being multifamily. And we define multifamily in our zoning as five units or more on one parcel. Um, and these other housing types that you see here are defined as separate unit types in our code. How does your code differentiate between a townhouse and a duplex? Uh, duplex can be, is two, two units on one lot. Townhouse can be on fee simple, like with a party wall, zero lot line, but it's actually on one unit on one lot. Um, and our code traditionally allowed you to do townhomes in up to a row of six, you know. Um, and it's since been expanded to allow townhomes in more zones, medium density zones, and I'll talk about that. Um, so like a lot of the uh, housing in the region, Oregon City renters and owners are burdened by rent and the cost of housing is defined as how much of your median family income is spent on housing. So we have approximately 50% of our renters which have who have a cost burden and 30% of our owners who have a cost burden, meaning they're spending more than 30% of their household income on rent or, or mortgage. The overall um, combines the two yeah, coverages. Yeah, that's right. Uh, majority of our household size is about one to two people, so household sizes are definitely declining. Um, and the last homelessness point in time count, and that became part of the discussion, but you can see from this chart that the homeless count was significant this last year, um, uh, just increased quite a bit. Um, and so part of the discussion with the Equitable Housing Code amendments also brought in the discussion about shelters and where shelters could be permitted through conditional use process in the city. Um, so the process began with the city commission setting their goals and priorities and one of those goals and priorities was to do this work um, as part of trying to foster more uh, diversity in housing and um, I want to explain how this fits into the bigger regulatory scheme about housing. So this is a slide we've used, you know, in the housing universe you have a variety of things, incentives, people's employment, how much they make, where they can work, how much, what their commute times were. And in the regulatory galaxy, we are only one small little, little blip in that, and we were zoning. So what we did was look at our zoning code. We didn't look at system development charges. We didn't look at jobs, housing balance. We didn't look at where the commuters are going, you know, what the market's doing. We had no funding to do a market analysis as part of this. We looked at um, the zoning code and we did do some supplemental analysis as far as transportation and public facilities go in that regard. But that's kind of where we were, we focused our efforts. Um, so the goal of this was to remove barriers and provide incentives uh, for equitable housing. It wasn't a zoning map change, it's just a zoning code change. So we were using all of our existing zones and the next, within those zones, uh, expanding the variety of housing units that might be allowed in each zone. And I've got a chart that summarizes that. It's the one I handed out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure I made enough for everybody, but there you go, yeah. So the uh, approach was to look at our zoning code and development regulations, which is also our public facilities requirements and that sort of thing, and look, for, look at providing greater flexibility and a greater variety of housing types. And this is frequently called the, me the missing middle, and that includes all these t housing types you see here. Um, we also had the consultants look at our guides and things, and come up with some educational materials that explain to people in common language how to build one of these units if they were wanting to do that and how to go through the city planning and building process. And we also have some mapping that we're still putting together that would provide generalized zoning for people to understand where they can do these unit types. So it started with a project advisory team back in 2016, it was formed with citizens. Um, and then as the process moved through the hearing process, 
um, which began in 2018 and just finished up in August of this year. There were additional zoning suggestions that came out of that that weren't necessarily housing related. Some of them had to do with things like food carts and public facilities and public improvement standards and that sort of thing. But the bulk of the amendments that were just passed were to do with housing code. Um, so there's a lot of public engagement. All of this is on our website. We've had many, many work sessions and hearings. Um, and we also had, uh, you know, the standard public notice requirements and all of that. Um, and we are still, this file, this legislative file is still open. Um, and we're looking at some select things that the city commission has put aside for additional review. Um, I will say that we're going into a comprehensive plan update process in the next few years. We ha don't have funding for all of it, but we're applying for that through the state. And some of the things that we didn't get tackled in this housing code amendment process, we're planning to take out to the public again, come back and look at it, take a bigger picture view. Um, and those include things like having a short term rental policy for the city. Uh, we don't currently have one. Clackamas County is adopting a short term rental policy. Um, maybe ours will look something like theirs. I'm not sure. Um, but it's definitely something we wanted more public input on before we just adopted code for it. Right now, if you want to do a short-term rental in the city, you've got to get a conditional use permit from the Planning Commission. It's a one-time thing. Um, but some people felt that that process was a little bit onerous and wanted to look at a, a more of a permit-oriented process that was based on that sort of thing. So. Um, we have summarized all the code amendments as we went through the process. We did a high level summary and a detailed summary. We tracked every public comment that we had and summarized that and um, did a couple of videos too to try to explain what we were doing from the beginning of the process and then at the end when we adopted it. And that's on our website. Um, we, our project advisory team was 15, 15 positions. It was pretty diverse. I was very surprised at the interest that we got, but there's a lot of interest in housing, so I shouldn't have been that surprised. It was just great to see uh, people that don't normally serve on committees come forward and serve on this committee. Unfortunately, we only had money to do a limited set of meetings, so we had five project advisory team meetings and then we did a lot of work on the ground with the consultant and staff and then traditional work sessions with planning commission and coming to you guys and the citizen involvement committee as well. Um, so, but the consensus of the project advisory team was to support the majority of the code amendments and they were a draft. And we started the uh, hearing process in July of 2018. And so that draft took on changes as it went through the public hearing process and the planning commission and the city commission made certain tweaks to it. But a lot of it largely held up and what was adopted. So um, this chart illustrates all the various housing types on the left and across the top we have our residential zones and our commercial and mixed use and industrial zones. Um, I, I left the industrial and, and employment zones off because there's no housing allowed in those zones unless you're like a night watch, night watchman type thing, or which we do allow in our campus industrial zones. But for the, there are no real housing opportunities in those zones, so the majority of them are here. Um, and in, this illustrates that you know it doesn't show the difference between the old code and the new code. This is just what's been adopted so far, and so. It significantly expanded the upper, the upper half of this chart is where the majority of our work occurred. So when we're talking about accessory dwelling units, cluster housing, internal conversion, corner duplexes, duplexes and attached single family, uh, a lot of, uh, those were expanded predominantly in the uh, medium density zones as a by right use. Single family residential, which is the R10, R8 and R6, largely didn't change. It already allowed accessory dwelling units and cluster housing. The new thing that happened was corner duplexes and internal conversions. And an internal conversion, I'll explain what that is. So this is our the bulk of our housing, the single family detached. Um, and you know it's, it takes a variety of forms, a lot of ages. 
Um, townhomes, this is an example from uh, Glen Oak Road area. Um, this particular development is all fee simple lots. Uh, they're not condos, they're actual units sold. Um, accessory dwelling units are uh, probably a term you've heard. Um, these are smaller units that are allowed wherever a single family detached residential unit is permitted and state law actually requires that the city uh, allow these throughout the city. So this was already on the books 2004. We just didn't see much of this developed. I think we had about 24, 25 units on the books uh, that went through an ADU process since 2004. They can be attached or detached. They can be in your basement, over your garage, but they are limited in size. Uh, manufactured home parks were made a legal use in the zone that they're in. Previously, they were a non-conforming use, and we have four manufactured home parks in the city provide a very important component to our housing stock. Um, so by adding these as a permitted use in the R3.5 zone, these, uh, these facilities can expand. Um, they can do renovations without having to go through a significant planning process to do so. Uh, and we just received an application from Claremont Mobile Home Park to add 24 units in the middle of their facility um, there. So that's something that would be a, if you do a new park or you make an addition to an existing park, that has to go through land use review, a type two review process. Um, corner duplexes are now a permitted use in low density <coughs> zones on corner lots. Um, and the idea here was to have design standards. As far as density goes, they count the same as a single family unit, but they have a design requirement that they have one door that faces uh, the street and it looks like a single family house and that sort of thing. And then duplexes are new permitted use in all of our medium density zones, and that includes the R3.5 which and the R5 zones. The R5 zone is predominantly in areas that have not yet been annexed into the city from the urban growth boundary area, like in the Park Place concept plan area, the South End concept plan area, and what is soon to be the Beaver Creek Road concept plan area. So. When we did our transportation analysis, majority of the focus of the analysis was on the impact of duplexes and the likelihood of those being permitted. Internal conversions are a way to um, divide an existing house up into one to th two to three units. Uh, the, uh, the intent here was to preserve existing homes and disincentivize scrape offs uh, there's a requirement that your home be at least 20 years old if you're going to do this. Um, and once you do over two units, uh, the building code requires that you, you, you follow commercial building standards for a multifamily. So whether or not somebody actually does three or four I, remains to be seen. I doubt very much that it would actually promote that. I, would, I could see people doing maybe one internal conversion to get another unit that's slightly bigger than an accessory dwelling unit allows, you know, and it would be uh, easier for them to do that through the building process. Um, and uh, so that's, that's a new thing. Cluster housing it used to be called cottage housing. Uh, cottage housing, cottage clusters are a development type that allows slightly more units at a very small building footprint. So the maximum living area for one of these cottages is, is 1,500 square feet, which could be distributed between the second and first floor. They have to have a common open space, a common community facility, um, and they would be, have common maintenance. So far, we've only seen one development application in Kanema for this, um, but we may see more um, as things move forward. Live work is, is a unit type where you can have an office or commercial use on the ground floor facing the street, and then either your residence in the back or um, <coughs> above you. And this is a permitted use in our mixed use zones and um, in our high density residential zones as well. 
three to four plexes is how we broke out a separate unit type from what was traditionally multifamily. A uh, three to four plex is now defined as its own development type. It's permitted in the medium density and high density residential zones through a type one building permit process. There's gonna be parking minimums and that sort of thing for those, as well as for accessory dwelling units. And they could take a variety of forms. They could be vertically attached and they could be uh, horizontally attached, um, similar to, uh, to a townhome. And then we have traditional multifamily and we adopted uh, commercial and multifamily uh, design standards, which are simpler than they used to be. Um, and in the high density residential zone, the R2 zone, where you're doing multifamily, if you're doing publicly subsidized affordable housing, um, which is defined as a certain income level, um, we offer a, an affordable housing density bonus up to 20%. Um, and the commercial design standards were simplified for things like what we call massing and horizontal and vertical articulation. And here's just an excerpt of some other changes. Um, our land division standards have been slightly simplified. Um, we are requiring street improvements for all development that is either new construction or more than 50% addition to an existing structure. Um, we are, we amended our height definition so that if you're in the floodplain in the downtown zone or the mixed use zone, you measure the building height from where you are required to build from because we require buildings to be built above the floodplain. And if you have to do that, you're kind of getting penalized on your height. So we, re we allow your height to be measured from the, f from the design flood elevation as opposed to wherever the street grade is, because it's, if it's flooding, you know, below at street grade, you know, and then you can do habitable space above that. But we had a hotel application about three years ago that had to get an adjustment from the standard. And that's when we realized that a lot of the development in the mixed use downtown would be subject to that same constraint. So the planning commission supported uh, measuring height in this manner in the floodplain. And uh, we also created brochures and guides uh, and upgraded our existing ones for all of these unit types. And uh, this is an example of one of those for accessory dwelling units. And it's just more uh, conversational. It actually has some examples two, like six examples of ADUs, two of which are actually constructed in Oregon City. And they had the cost of those in there too. So people have an idea of what they're facing. And that's what that looks like. So this is the chart for us to refer back to. And we also put together what we're calling it a cost estimator, but it's the whole point of this cost estimator is to for someone to enter in all of the known costs, soft costs, system development charges, any, uh, any consulting costs that they're gonna incur when they put together a land use application and really try to figure out at the front end what they're facing in terms of review fees and just to get to an entitlement or, or a planning approval. And we're also building and building permit fees to that. It's a bit of a moving target to keep this cost estimator up to date because fees change and building costs change. But we're hopeful that once we put this thing online, uh, people will use it and then it'll have a disclaimer on it saying, you know, these are not necessarily current, but it's helpful. Um, so that's another thing that was done. And then the mapping resource that we're putting online will be a generalized mapping application that rather than having all these different zones and colors and everything, it would just have a generalized color for each unit type um, so that people can quickly reference that. As far as the transportation analysis goes, um, John Replinger has been our consultant for many, many years. We asked him to do a review of the 
transportation planning rule implications of making these code amendments. Um, so he started that by looking at the 2013 transportation system plan <clears throat> and then comparing the projections in the plan to um, what we anticipated might happen by allowing these code amendments. He looked at the individual unit types and then looked at the trip generation from the Institute of Traffic Engineers manual. And we also looked at historic permitting trends and housing mixes based on what data we had, as well as the census data that was the, the, the more current. Um, and based on that, the transportation system plan projected almost 8,000 new households by 2035. Um, this projection, you know, it, it, we've looked at, uh, we just completed a housing needs analysis as well, um, which kind of undershoots that by a significant amount. So I think the TSP t had kind of a worst case scenario associated with it. Um, so anyway, that's the uh, a, a growth of approximately 61% between 2010 and 2035. And then John looked at all the dwelling types um, and compared them to what we currently allow in the zones that we allow. The duplexes we assumed would be, it's currently about 2% of all our housing stock. And with these code amendments, we made an assumption that it might double, you know, um, and that could produce 160 new units of duplexes. That was seen to be fairly insignificant and spread out throughout the city. As far as single family detached versus townhomes, um, what you read about in this report is that there was a, a, a slight weekday in, increase associated with townhomes, but a significant peak hour decrease associated with townhomes in medium density zones. So that was kind of a wash. And then with respect to accessory dwelling units, internal conversions and cluster housing, they're such a small percentage of the, house, of the dwelling types that we anticipate that that was pr fairly insignificant too. Can so based on this- for a second? Yeah. Why the peak hour decrease? Um, I think it's just based on the ITE manual and the peak hour assumption for that. I, I don't know quite, a, I'd love to look at that in more detail and be happy to get back to you on that. Um, let's see, on page three of John's report, it talks about that under table two. Uh, but it's I from can't, the trip generation manual. It's all about, yeah, trip generation and assumptions. So it's one is, one, one is an IT category 210 and it has a peak hour trip generation that's different than, than single family. But I'm not a traffic engineer, so. Uh, um, and so that is the summary of the transportation analysis. Um, the idea of that spread across the entire city over the planning horizon of about 20 years the impacts would be insignificant, which is a little ironic because what we're trying to do is promote these housing units and the market may just not produce them. Um, so, you know, to bear that in mind, uh, if there's no demand and the demand continues to be for, you know, what is traditionally on the books in terms of zoning, then, you know, I don't think there's any significant impact. But we'll have to do further analysis as things move forward and we see the impact of these proposals if they, if they actually pan out. Um, and then on top of that, if somebody applies for a zone change, they've got to do further analysis for that to support that zone change and show compliance with not only the transportation system plan, but also the statewide transportation planning rule. Um, so I anticipate that as we move forward with the comprehensive plan update, we'll be looking at this in more detail. Um, so that's all I have. Um, this is a final chart that when we had our first open house, people really did like the idea of adding in this new component to the Oregon City's housing choices. And, and that's where the, those green dots all represent. So thank you very much. So I have a question. When, yeah. when city grows and expands uh, and you add new areas to the city, Mm -hmm. It seems like 
predominantly it's always single family housing that's dominated. So yeah. what mm -hmm. is the city doing about that? Well, our three concept plan areas are probably gonna look a lot more diverse than what is currently within the city limits because they're, we had to adopt, uh, um, for example, that R5 zone I was referring to, which is a one unit per 5,000 square foot lot and that sort of thing. Um, and they also have to have some commercial zoning, small commercial zoning there too. We haven't seen a lot of annexation, so we don't know yet how, what it's gonna look like, um, but those concept plans are binding and we have plan designations that support this kind of diversity now. Um, so, um, but it's not, we, it is definitely much, you know, we're not mandating that somebody build a particular housing type. If there's four housing types permitted in the zone, we're not gonna mandate they build the, you know, the highest density one. If they wanna build single family detached in the medium density zone, the code will allow that. If they wanna build townhomes in the medium density zone, you know, the code will allow that. Um, they have to be clear and objective standards and that's what we wrote into the code. Um, you know, certain amount of square footage per unit, um, certain design standards and those kinds of things. Um, we do have to show that we are meeting our housing targets, not just for statewide goals, but also for metro, metro reasons because of this project. Um, and it, I think it's largely a consequence of, of uh, lot size um, and what it's close to in terms of what gets built first. I think the likelihood in, like for example, you take Park Place, you know, if, if somebody comes in and annexes 92 acres in Park Place, and then the first section that they're probably gonna build is gonna be single family detached, and then they get some cash flow going. And then as more development occurs, they will start to move into uh, other types of development, but we can't predict how that happens or how quickly it happens. <clears throat> yeah, most of our developers currently are uh, single family builders, but um, I've certainly heard from other builders who said, well, if these code amendments go through, I would seriously consider doing a cluster development, or I would seriously consider doing um, row houses in the R2 zone rather than apartments and we're requiring a minimum density for those areas because we have limited zoning for high density residential. And so the minimum density requirements also kick in and that kind of thing. So um, the, the zoning tools are there. You know, it's really, that's as much as the planning division can really control at this point. If there are other incentives outside of zoning that the city commission thinks are necessary in order to meet these targets, then that's something that we probably want to entertain as we go through the comprehensive plan process, um, update process. Could you bring up the cost estimator permit visual? Sure. It's a draft, and I'll warn you. <laughs> Doesn't that uh, permit figure seem kind of low, $157? Yeah, that, that is an old slide. Um, oh, you know, the, our current a, SDC for single families has gone up. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, that's not indicative of what's on the books. It's just an example. Mm -hmm. I have uh, two questions. Uh, yeah. One is that pie chart you had at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, do you have that broken down by access, by transit routes, by how, uh, what percentage of Sorry. The housing types are within a quarter mile of transit. Like uh, this one? The, no, uh, the, that this one. one. Yeah. Is, is there a slide that breaks that down by how uh, many single family housing are within uh, a quarter mile of like frequent transit? Because you want to no. have higher density uh, or higher density housing near transit. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, this is right out of the uh, census data, so I don't think it was broken down in terms of that. If we were to do that through our own GIS, we could probably do that. Okay. Uh, and that's a really good thing that we could look at in the comp plan update. And I think it is 
the way we're building the scope for that comp comprehensive plan update with something we definitely want to look at because mm -hmm. the housing needs analysis that we have right now is a is a baseline and it has recommendations you know for us to look exactly at those kind of locational things yeah. um, and build off of that initial baseline so that'll be an important part of that for sure yeah. and that actually gets to my point with uh you know we're not discussing house bill 2001 here that'll be a later thing but that's part of my goal with that uh discussion is to have the higher density housing for house bill 2001 be along transit corridors instead of right. just citywide yeah because i don't want to have higher density housing where there's no transit access because that's just inducing more car trips and we want right. to reduce car trips right because that's my uh, goal uh, and then my second question is about this uh, document here. Uh, looks like it's a uh, citywide only study. Is there uh, any analysis on how uh, this impacts with car trips versus transit trips? If you have higher density, how basically the same thing I just asked before. Mm. If there's an analysis looking at uh, if you have more duplexes in areas that uh, no transit access, how will right. that impact car trips versus if you have duplexes near transit access? Right. Because um, I don't think that is covered in here, is that correct? No, it's not. Okay. No, that, that wasn't in, in the scope of this review. It was sort of just looking at a possible scenario, of, of, but it didn't look at proximity to transit. Okay. Yeah. Pete, have you uh, had dealings here in the recent past with developers who are large enough to take some of these concept plans uh, and uh, aggregate enough land to really do something. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Seems like they're smaller developers and they don't cross over and do mixed use, uh, homework, uh, single families and that. Um, they kind of specialize in one area or the other. Right. Um, well, one of, the th one of the things we offered in the code amendments, which I didn't talk about, was we, uh, we we amended our master plan chapter and we're renaming it master plan planned unit development. So if, we've, if a developer assembled enough land and wanted to do a more diverse housing development, which had open space and parks and a variety of housing mix and maybe uh, higher density over here and lower density over there, all in one application, the code now allows that previously you know, you come in with a subdivision that's one phase and you want to do another one that's a second subdivision application and that sort of thing. That's the way it's traditionally been up until now. So uh, we may see that in the park place. In fact, we're actually requiring that the applicant provide a master plan for that 92 acre annexation area in, in park place. So mm -hmm. uh, not just because of the housing issue, but also because of the public uh, public utility phasing and parks and how is that stuff going to be paid for so yeah um, it is it's definitely something that um, we want to promote if, if possible is but, there some you know, way the city could in, provide incentives for that to start happening uh, I think the, the I think the question is really are we going to is the city going to try to subsidize advanced planning of public facilities in some of these concept plan areas. And, you know, that's a discussion we're having with about the Beaver Creek Road concept plan next. So I think that would be a good good question to ask Christina, but. <laughs> Way to pass the buck. Yeah. City is trying to promote mm. more diversity in terms of the housing and you want more, more density and, and more affordable housing but so what's why not allow a duplex in in r10 r8 and r6 right i mean it seems like opportunity you know i know developers they would want to build these part of their developments but the code mm -hmm. doesn't allow them to do that yeah um well uh you know it was it was a public process and it you know it came out of uh, desire to find a missing middle that where there previously was none. Um, and so we didn't want to push the envelope too quickly. Um, and we have a significant amount of medium density areas that have yet to be developed. So I think, you know, it, it kind of made sense when we went through the project advisory team to 
try to maintain the integrity of single family residential neighborhoods because that is largely what Oregon City is while balancing that with the need to redevelop in our urban growth boundary areas. Um, House Bill 2001 yeah. may change that. I was going to um, say that. Yeah. And, and when Department of Land Conservation and Development comes out with rulemaking, hopefully earlier later this year, we'll have a clearer idea of how it applies. Um, but we're looking for guidance from the state and we're looking for guidance from the city commission on that, on that particular question before yeah. we move forward on it. Yeah. Oh, Pete, I want to thank you for coming. And it is, you spent fifth, almost, uh, say, 40 minutes on this, and we have other business yeah. to accomplish. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So next is the Beaver Creek Road concept plan. And uh, again, I'd like to point out that <laughs> we, we do have other stuff. Knowledge. <laughs> thank you, Chair Beckenbach. Uh, my name is Christina Robertson Gardner. I'm a senior planner with uh, the planning department. And my goal tonight is to provide uh, an update on the Beaver Creek Road concept planning code amendments, specifically the transportation element, a little uh, overview of the content of the city commission work session in August, and kind of next steps. So I uh, don't need necessarily any um, specific um, recommendation or comments from the oh, it's not on. <laughs> I don't need any specific um, recommendations this evening, but I, it's kind of really more of a uh, direction for the TAC to track this project. And as this moves through the hearings process, if there's a time when the Transportation Advisory Committee wants to make comment, um, I want to give you enough lead time that you understand wh where, when that can happen. Um, it doesn't have to be at night. <laughs> so really think of this as more I'm um, giving you lots of information to kind of digest and then sit on for a little bit and then we'll have the city commission work session in November, which I'll talk a little more about. So the Beaver Creek Road concept plan is uh, one of the three concept plan areas. It was um, uh, added to the urban growth boundary in 2002, 2004. Uh, a requirement of any urban growth boundary addition is a concept plan. And in that concept plan, we look at ability for um, uh, appropriate density of any housing type uh, to make sure that we don't underdevelop, so we don't have to come back and keep expanding the urban growth boundary. So it's that right sizing of development, as well as looking at infrastructure. Uh, it, the concept plan was adopted in 2008 and then readopted in 2016. So my job as staff uh, was to take a 60-page narrative document and turn it into code. <laughs> and what has happened in this time period is actually compared to Beaver Creek Road concept, I'm sorry, Park Place concept plan in South End is we actually have a, a fair amount of the property has already been annexed into the city. So the Oregon City Golf Course, um, which you can't see, but is the lower end as well as kind of the airfield and some more of the properties south of Loader Road. Not all, but a lot of the properties south of Loader Road are already in the city limits, but they don't have zoning today because we don't have any implementing zoning for them. So they're holding the county zone of FU10, which is future urban 10 acres. So uh, they are waiting for this process to happen in order to achieve the city zone that's applicable uh, for the concept plan. And then development will happen for properties inside the city limits as you know the property owners want to wish to develop. And then properties that are outside the city limits but inside the urban growth boundary, when they wish to annex, they will have a zone available for them when they come in for an annexation request. So as part of the, uh, the rezoning process, um, it, the really two main outputs will come out of this new zoning code uh, that'll show compliance. And as Pete was mentioning, clear and objective standards for housing is a requirement. When you're already inside the city limits, um, we need to provide a path that is, as I say clear and objective, it's kind of like the fourth grade math. You know, you need to be able to show um, 
uh, how someone can meet the requirements to build a house. So it has to be very objective criteria. Uh, we can't require uh, an application to go through a master plan process or a planned unit development. Um, that, that's an option, but we have to provide that clear and objective standard. So that's kind of the red line code we're looking at, as well as new zoning maps. So as part of this rezoning, uh, and through the public engagement we heard this spring, kind of three questions were coming out of it, and that's when we directed our consultant team um, to look at, which was intersection control uh, on Beaver Creek Road in the concept plan boundaries. Um, there was a need for um, intersection control, so that could be a roundabout or a signal. The transportation system plan doesn't specify. The concept plan identifies roundabouts as a kind of preferred alternative, but it wasn't um, the transportation system plan kind of left it a little open. So we have some signals already on Beaver Creek and we have some unsignalized intersections. So as this moves forward, what is the right intersection control? Uh, roundabouts, signals, or combination thereof. Uh, Holly Lane connection, which um, is not on this map, uh, but there is a parallel road to Beaver Creek that's called Holly Lane extension that will go up to Thayer Road. And that is also looking at a parallel route to provide other connectivity, other options. So not everyone has to all head in their cars to the intersection of 213 and Beaver Creek. So we're trying to provide some more connectivity. So how important is that connection to the transportation model? And uh, the third one was the uh, looking back at um, the cross section of Beaver Creek, which was adopted in the plan, which is a three lane cross section. So that's a direction, um, in either, uh, I'm sorry, is one lane in either direction with the center turn lane. And uh, then there was some requests to take a look at uh, would a five lane cross section be more appropriate in this area or portions of Beaver Creek? So in some areas, would a five lane cross section be more appropriate? That would be two lanes in each direction and a center turn lane. So this is the adopted three lane cross section as part of the Beaver Creek Road concept plan. And it really shows kind of this large um, internal uh, landscape medium, which is also potentially be for stormwater treatment. Um, this is really great when you are building kind of a clean road from start to finish. Uh, and it would probably be more of a inverted V road because you want the stormwater to go in the middle. Well, right now we have a lot of road already built that's a crown road. So that's one question, how do, how do you even transition that? So maybe stormwater may have to be on the outside of the road and not in this internal V. Uh, some of the goals of the adopted three lane section in the concept plan was to provide um, a really pedestrian friendly connection between kind of the east side, the concept plan area and the west side, which is the high school and the college and the existing Caulfield neighborhood. So people felt that they were kind of an integrated neighborhood of the city rather than having a kind of a busy road that separated. So um, the three lane was identified because it, that's what the transportation analysis identified in 2008 was the appropriate width. And then also looking at uh, treatments such as landscaping and this medium to provide that feeling of connection. But it's been not, it's 2019, it's not 2008. So we heard from the community and some of our elected officials that they want us to relook at this as part of this readoption process. Uh, one thing we had to do as part of rezoning, uh, as Pete mentioned, when you are rezoning property, so these are the properties that are zoned FU10 today, we'll be getting their new count, the new city zone. We have to look at the transportation planning rule, which is a statewide planning rule. And so DKS Associates, which is our transportation consulting firm, did do a TPR analysis, and that was attached to the August City Commission work session. And they did find that the three lane road met the requirements to meet the transportation system plan. So as adopted, this plan is, is, can legally meet the transportation requirements. So no, um, nothing is required to be revised in order to obtain zoning for these properties. But if of all times, this is a chance for the city to have that conversation again and says, if this is what we want, if there's something more, um, what do we want that's more or different? Or what are, what are the, um, as always, there's um, upsides and downsides for any choice. You, you push one, something one way and you kind of get it a little bit the other way. So we're having this conversation this kind of summer and fall into winter about is the three lane cross section 
appropriate and how much of the road would be three sections. So this is an example of a five lane section in the city today. This is kind of right near first street. Um, and so this is two lanes in each direction and that's so that center turn lane just to give you some orientation. So we're also doing a lot of work, as you know, um, to help with connectivity in this 213 uh, Beaver Creek corridor. So Myers Road uh, is under construction. So a lot of people coming into the city um, to in points farther north will now potentially uh, take a left to use the new Myers Road extension to get onto 213. So we're trying to pull some people off of that Beaver Creek Road 213 intersection. Uh, we also have um, a new uh, capital improvement project added as part of our ultra mobility uh, analysis that was done and approval a couple, uh, last year, which is a new free flowing right lane uh, going from Beaver Creek Road North onto 213. So today you kind of have to stop and yield when you're going northbound on 213. And a future project will allow that free flow right. So in the morning we can get a lot of people who are currently kind of stuck and have to wait to get through to northbound. So that is a potential capital improvement that could be done and paid through system development fees. And a lot of those system development fees come from development in areas like the Beaver Creek Road concept plan. Uh, we, the uh, DKS did the traffic forecasting. A lot of people uh, want to know, and so this slide is really to, to remind everybody, when you do transportation analysis and forecasting, you look not just at Oregon City's uh, transportation projections, but also within the, the whole wider region. So going out to Malala, to rural Clackamas County. So when a traffic engineer is looking at that projection, it's not just within the city limits of Oregon City. They're understanding the projected regional growth out into that rural urban divide. So some of the benefits of a five lane section is it does provide more capacity, um, but also as, uh, as you know from induced demand, you provide more capacity and more people find that open space and fill it. So for all the people that um, we're trying to divert maybe to use Myers Road to 213, as we provide more capacity, they may just wanna stay on Beaver Creek and not necessarily use Myers Road. Um, you know, as unless you really add a lot of landscaping islands and a lot of really good landscaping treatment, five lane roads do encourage higher transportation speeds. And um, it's generally less inviting to pedestrian cyclists, once again, unless you really invest in good landscaping. A three lane section provides a little less capacity uh, for traffic as they move through. Um, you, one thing you do have in a three lane road in Beaver Creek is we are not allowing um, left turns into driveways on Beaver Creek. So if you are in the Beaver Creek Group concept plan area, all of the traffic will have to use the existing intersection. So Claremont, Loader, Myers, and Glen Oak Road. So we wanna make sure when you're kind of driving on Beaver Creek, it's gonna be a little bit more of a boulevard without like what you see in Malala, which is all these conflicts between driveways. You really are not gonna be able to get into the Beaver Creek Road concept plan area but for the existing intersections we have today. So that will allow a lot of, of free flow traffic. You're not gonna be stopping to have these conflicts or people trying to get in and out of private driveways or private commercial driveways. Um, but will you sure. allow pedestrians access in between those? It depends, we'll have to take a look as we design to see if there's space for if there needs to be a pedestrian refuge, yeah. So that's kind of dialing down to that next level of design, which we are still kind of floating in that 20,000 foot decision. Uh, so the, the next question is roundabouts, kind of a um, little bit of roundabout 101. There's always upsides and downsides to choosing a roundabout. Um, you know, roundabouts do create slower speeds, so you have to slow down when you go into a roundabout. Um, you have that kind of more smooth traffic flow. So you're going slower, but you're not stopping. Whereas if you're at intersections, you might be going faster between the intersections, but then you have to stop. So your travel time may be the same, but at least, but in roundabouts, you're kind of continuously moving. Uh, it's more aesthetically pleasing. Sometimes they can be seen as a gateway. Um, there may be additional landscape requirements um, for long-term maintenance, but they aren't necessarily that different than long-term signal maintenance. Uh, so uh, kind of small, uh, the, the roundabouts can be um, really helpful with um, how, um, 
how much capacity you can really get into a road. So with a roundabout and a three-lane road, you might have more capacity than you think, especially <coughs> if you have these controlled intersections and not having uh, driveways out on non-intersection uh, access. So there are some disadvantages of roundabouts. Um, sometimes drivers don't pay as much attention to pedestrians because pedestrians don't have a signal. So uh, pedestrians, you have to be able to redesign it so pedestrians are really aware where they're crossing. Uh, they don't really recommend multi-lane roundabouts when there's high pedestrian and bicycle activities because there's a lot of conflicts when you have more than one lane in the roundabout. Construction costs can be initially more expensive than the traffic signal, but once again, once you, they're built, the maintenance costs will even out a little bit more. Uh, there is a process to acquire additional needed property. So oftentimes, um, roundabouts take up more land than what you uh, have an existing for an intersection, so you have to do some property acquisition. And one problem with roundabouts is you can't build a half a roundabout. So you, you often, whereas a signal, you can do a leg or two, but usually when you build a roundabout, you got to build a roundabout. So it's a question of how easy can you phase uh, that intersection control. There's a lot of other factors. Um, there's a question of how much the county is contributing to the cost of an upsized road. There's jurisdictional transfer discussions we're having with Clackamas County. Uh, right now, for um, we have a current system development policy that pays for the upsizing of any local road. So um, we probably aren't going to be, um, probably STC uh, credits would have to be given to, to, to build uh, the upside road if it's done through development. Um, the question of constructability, how can this be done in phases if Beaver Creek Road concept plan is more market led? Um, how do we plan ahead for something that may be in multiple phases? Uh, and um, there will be many others. So this is just a, other things that staff and our city commission is thinking about in this conversation. So what staff did this summer is we made some initial recommendations, which is I like to call the staff hat of um, what you have is adopted, what you have can be built um, with our and get a rezone. So. Right now, unless until we have further direction by our community or city commission, we're recommending um, that um, keep the three-lane road and for the full length, unless uh, you know at, until we have that further conversation. This is really kind of above and beyond what you legally need to do to be rezoned. We do recommend that Holly Lane connection needs to remain. It was actually part of um, a it was a project that was identified the transmission system plan that allowed us to get our alternative mobility targets. So that's a, a piece. So that if we remove the Holly Lane connection, we might have to open up that alternative mobility conversation. And intersection control, uh, staff kind of looked at the ability to build roundabouts out uh, as part of a um, process that was more um, market-driven, developer-led, and it's going to require a fair amount of land to acquire at the intersections, especially the west side where there's existing development. Um, so we are kind of highlighting kind of the, 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 the cost implications of that, and we'll, we're going to be providing more opportunities um, for the public to kind of weigh in and look at that. So what are the next steps? Um, we are continually working on different options and showing uh, we've actually been working uh, with our GIS department and we have some sample three and five lane roundabout overlays. So we're gonna be putting on our existing uh, intersections to kind of get a handle of the order and magnitude of size. Uh, we will have additional public outreach. A survey is gonna be created and a kind of a public outreach comment option. I'm hoping to get that up next week and I'll be up uh, through the November 12th City Commission work session. The Planning Commission will be um, reviewing this as part of the hearings process at their November 25th work session. The Planning Commission uh, will at some point will take the, all of the code packages uh, that for the concept plan adoption, so the rezoning map and the code amendments, the Planning Commission has been working on this whole fall and will make a recommendation to the City Commission and then the City Commission will hold hearings in the new year. So timing wise, the Transportation Advisory Committee has some time before you need to make any comment. And I do recommend if you're interested in this topic to um, take the public survey when it goes out and we'll make sure that you're all, uh, you all get an email of that. Uh, you attend or watch the City Commission work session and you attend or watch the Planning Commission hearings in November. And then I think that's my last slide. Any, John, you had a question. Um, 
at the financing for the whole Beaver Creek Roadway. I'm trying to conjure a mental picture of parcels that are small parcels that already have driveways out onto them and maybe has a rural section rather than an urban section. Are you looking at the potential of a LID to, in other words, instead of putting it all on SDCs and state mm -hmm. and local funding, I mean, ultimately, if it gets done right, it benefits the adjacent properties. Correct. And that would make them eligible for some kind of L LID. Yeah, operation. and as always, that's, that's kind of where I always say that planning, planning and zoning can set the table for these discussions, but things like local improvement district and financing and money questions, really that's where you get to your elected officials and the city commission that really that have to look and balance all of these issues. Uh, it is a, the Beaver Creek Road concept plan is a, is a little bit odd in the sense that on the east side is where all the redevelopment opportunities are. So that land can be acquired and built when development mm -hmm. comes in. The west side, you have the college, the high school, and kind of existing subdivisions. And that, except for a small area around Claremont, um, you're probably not, or Loader Road, excuse me, you're not going to get a lot of redevelopment on the west side. And so um, it's a little imbalanced about what the, so you may not get, even if you adopt a five lane road, you may only get two lanes northbound. You might never get two lanes southbound just because of the reality of there's not a lot of redevelopment options on the west side unless it becomes more of a capital improvement pro project where you do do land acquisition. So these are, these are all the kind of options and issues that we'll be bringing to the city commission in November. The local improvement district is always an option, but it local improvement district is initiated and agreed upon by property owners. Um, I was reviewing the DTS uh, traffic study, and I believe transit was not included on the intersections in there. Uh, from a quick review of it, I just want to confirm whether for the uh, for, for which section for the Beaver Creek uh, Road from 213 going south through the corridor, because uh, the CCC Express Shuttle uses a 213 interchange and Claremont uh, mm -hmm. interchange or yeah. intersection. So I didn't see transit included in those uh, intersections for the traffic study. And I, I don't know how that impacts the three lane versus five lane discussion, but. Are you, uh, and this is once again, I'm gonna give okay. my, I'm not a transportation okay. engineer, but uh, is this a design question or a, a, a kind of a, a traffic number analysis? Traffic number analysis to make sure that the study, D DKS, because I think I think that the city is using that study to determine the three lane versus five lane discussion. And I just want to make sure we have the best information we have for that, that uh, discussion. Well, I think that like, so the number of, the number of uh, transit, um, like basically bus trips on that route, I can, I can check in, okay. but um, you know, I think uh, they were meeting the requirements of the transportation system plan. Okay. And um, so that was done, I, I mean, to me, a lot of transit is, is a design issue because of the number of buses that are actually using that is de minimis to that larger conversation. So if you have um, seven buses versus 12, if you expand your route, that's, that's, that's a number that's, that's de minimis in the larger thousands of vehicles, yeah. but it is a design question, absolutely. Yeah. And the reason why I'm asking about this is because uh, if you have more transit trips, then that reduces my car trips mm -hmm. and the less need for widening a road yeah. because people are using transit, which uses less of the mm -hmm. uh, congestion on the road. Yeah, and, and that hub of Clackamas Community College and and um, the other quick thing, I know you have lots of time, you know, we have more uh, prod items on your agenda, but Beaver Creek is, concept plan is actually very unique because we have the north end jobs and the south end housing. Mm -hmm. And so for tra for transit, it's the only one of the few places in the city where people drop off and pick up in the same direction. So we're getting bi-directional use, which is mm -hmm. really big when you want TriMet to come out and build lines and where yeah. you develop. There's one more point for time. Okay. Or, um, <laughs> a statement was made that you're hoping that people will go from Beaver Creek to Myers Road over to Highway 213. Well, that is an option. So you, as you create more connectivity, that is an option for people to use. Has there been any study made about how many maybe would be diverted in that direction? It seems like a counter. Uh, not counter necessarily. If it's me. really, if you have a lot of congestion around 213 Beaver Creek, you're always looking where there's least congestion. But 
as part of the transportation analysis, they did do trip distribution. So they did assign a specific number of trips to Myers Road. Okay, and then also, um, seems like the five lane versus three lane, it's kind of a no brainer to me because um, <clears throat> the sheer volume of traffic, I kind of, try to compare that with the intersection of Highway 213 and Beaver Creek Road, where when they first designed that, it sounded like a pretty good deal. Now it's a total failure. Why didn't they put an overpass in to begin with? Um, theoretically. And that I compare that to a five lane versus a three lane, where you hope that a three lane will would cause fewer people to drive that that road. Uh, I, I kind of doubt it. Um, and then the roundabouts seem to me like a win-win situation. You know, I'm sure money is a factor, you know, it always is no matter what plan we have, but uh, roundabouts from what I've seen everywhere I've been can't be beat versus traffic signals. Those are more like statements than questions I have. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll have a lot of opportunity to, to, to be involved. Uh, I mean, these are great, these are much larger conversations that we, you know, I'm, I'm excited that we're taking on as a city and kind of walking through the, the, the pros and cons of it. Uh, I was curious, your traffic consultant recommended the three lane section they said that the three-lane section was what was adopted. The transportation and analysis said that it could be met, and so as a transportation consultant, they said that you can build the three-lane section, and they recommended that you could build what was adopted. So this is this larger question. Mm -hmm. We legally can adopt the three-lane section. If well, we want to adopt something more, what's as a conversation as a community, what are the the um, what are the opportunities and constraints that go with that? Make it quick. I'll make it quick. <laughs> um, some studies have found that uh, three-lane road sections are safer than five-lane uh, sections because there's less conflict, you know, uh, side crashes and all those other reasons. Uh, I cannot be included in this discussion because I think according to the slide that solid safety was not one of the things being evaluated on three lane versus five lane. Oh yeah, that's a piece. It might, I okay. mean, but I'm not trying to yeah. embarrass or anything. I'm just saying that that's something that in my mind is critical because uh, safety is very important in my mind. So if we can include that into the discussion, mm -hmm. three lane versus five lane. Yeah, because changing lanes is itself Correct. a conflict. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on, I believe, if I get back to the agenda, that, uh, oh, hold on, hold on. I do, I forgot. Uh, you might want to, Christina, yeah. you might want to hang around here. Paul, you wanted to make a comment on yes, this yes. Beaver Creek Road. I'm gonna hold, I want you to hold it down to the minimum amount of time or I will stop you. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, Thank you, minutes? Paul Edgar. Three minutes. <laughs> it should be three. Oh, Paul Edgar, Oregon City. I was on the Clackamas County Transportation Advisory Council and I've been on a lot of uh, regional and state uh, committees on transportation. One of the issues here is that is Holly Lane and Holly Lane is in a seismic area where there is dramatic landslides occurring right now. Um, it is a virtually a dead end street mindset. What I think it's, in, it's not correct to continue to put Holly Lane into the equation when the cost and probability of it ever being used make it uh, just not reasonable. Uh, anybody that has any critical thinking skills could go back and take a look at this and say, no, Holly Lane should not be part of it. So if Holly Lane is not part of the equation, what can we do to handle the number of trips? And one other issue that's happening is the number of pass-through trips, not coming from any development on Beaver Creek, but coming outside 
from all of these other directions is now 10 times what it was 10 years ago or five years ago. It's expanding rapidly. So we completely underestimate the impact of like Molala, all, all of these areas out through it, everything going out uh, of Beaver Creek. So we are getting so many more trucks and cars and everybody else. Also, we have got to know that Highway 213 and Beaver Creek Road is a strategic urban freight route. And it, it, therefore, it has other standards which are applicable to freight mobility in itself and job creation. And now, if I was to do it, my recommendation would be to go to five lanes. And let's just, oh, that, by going to five lanes, what you do is you eliminate all of the subjective uh, ideas of saying, can we use Holly Lane? No. So why not just plan it and do it right now? I remember the state when we we're creating the bypass off of uh, to bypass Clackamas. What they did was they they created the new route around, and then all of a sudden they're in the middle of it, and they said, "Boy, we could for ten percent more, we could make it four lanes." And somebody said, "Why didn't you say that in the first place?" So the cost add-on to create five lanes is not much. One last thing I would like to get out of this thing. Bike boulevards, separated bike path, pedestrian path uh, on the Clackamas Community College side and the Oregon City High School side running that whole area would be a dramatic improvement in reducing the number of trips. It, it, uh, one of the things I did early on in my life when I was on a Columbia River Crossing Committee was that uh, I understated in my mind how many people would use bikes or pedestrians and what I've been blown out. So I will tell you, I, in that early on, I made a mistake. And now all I, all I come back and say, I, I think we should really take a serious look at making it part of the plan, making the plan include five lanes. Forget about Holly Lane. If you don't know anything about it, come to the, some of the next meetings on landslides and you'll get a full story and update that's coming up right now. Thank you. And thank you. And his points uh, probably should be looked at to see if they should be incorporated into the future work. A lot of Mr. Edgar's points, I think will be um, addressed as part of the city commission work session. Cause there, I mean, we've been hearing more yeah. uh, comments like that. Thank you. Okay, let's see, public works report. Yes, um, so Dana is gonna cover a couple topics. Uh, Jason is gonna cover a couple. And there are three things that I'll mention when they're done uh, uh, that I wanted to give you guys heads up and I'm sorry they didn't make the agenda, but they'll be very brief. Okay, uh, who's going first? I've got Malala Avenue. <coughs> I apologize, I've got a little bit of a cold here, so I'm trying not to cough in the microphone. Um, so we've got a, just a short little PowerPoint, and then, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, a handout that was passed around um, from Kittleson and Associates that addresses questions from last month's meeting. Um, so they reviewed the video and um, compiled the, the following six questions um, and have supplied answers to those. So I'll just kind of briefly walk through them. If you've got detailed questions, um, I'll give it my best shot uh, to answer those. Um, and then I've got just a couple of slides on some key community concerns along the project. Um, Mr. Atkinson had a question about addition of an exclusive pedestrian phase. Um, and actually, was, it may not have actually been his question. It might have been more of a leading pedestrian interval. Correct. Um, and so I've made a note about that, and we'll look at that in the project. Thank you. Um, assuming the question was an exclusive pedestrian phase, um, the ability to implement that at the uh, Beaver Creek and Malala intersection um, would create a failure of the intersection. It would, it would allocate um, 
essentially too much time mm -hmm. to pedestrian only movements with no vehicles moving and you the queues would fill up and it would fail the intersection. So an exclusive pedestrian phase um, at that intersection doesn't work. Um, from um, Mr. Ard representing Craig Danielson, um, there was three questions. Um, question about the collected pedestrian volumes um, done in November, and then the fact that those were not increased for 2040 traffic operations at the intersection. Um, so you'll see on the bottom of page two, um, the discussion about that. Um, so it's a lot of technical traffic engineer information, um, but essentially with the pedestrian volume that is assumed from today, um, which is the 20 in the midday and 24 in the PM peak, that, that triggers a pedestrian phase every cycle for that. Um, sorry, that's the mm, westbound leg, the where the, the cross, where is con there was concerns about those pedestrians with the right turns. So essentially the modeling shows that that pedestrian phase being triggered every cycle. So it's already kind of been addressed. So doubling the pedestrians doesn't change that analysis much. Um, it does provide, as you can see there, just uh, a 0.1 second delay for the intersection um, and a 0.3 second delay for that southbound and through right turn movement. So you wouldn't notice the difference. That makes sense. Um, question three was a request to do an apples to apples comparison for the signal operations for the 2040 no build and build conditions, essentially related to signal cycle lengths. So the current signal operates at 100 or 110 second cycle. So everybody gets a turn every 110 seconds. Um, our traffic modeling shows that in 2040, um, our traffic modeling shows in the future condition with all the lane changes that we it would recommend a 140 second interval. And so his, his concern was that we were comparing today's configuration with 100 seconds and the future condition with 140 seconds and that wasn't an apples to apples comparison. And so we've provided that if we left the intersection as it is today, and switched it to 140 seconds. So you can see those comparisons. Um, so the, the letter slash number is, um, the, the letter is the level of service. So um, a level of service E is considered acceptable. Um, it's sort of like a report card grading. F is a failure. Um, and then the number is the seconds in delay. So that you would experience. So we really, um, we actually see slight delays in number of seconds, but the level of service or the grade of it is, is similar. So you, you, would, you would experience a, a few more seconds waiting your turn. During but, the midday. Yes, during midday. And also in the PM peak. But still operating at an acceptable level, so not at a point where it fails. Question four was um, concern about the introduction of the southbound left turn trap lane, where we will convert that inner through lane to a left turn lane um, that makes you turn left. And so because you're in that lane thinking it's a through lane as it is today, you would get stuck turning left and you may try to either merge over or you know, go through the intersection in a straight movement. Um, and so the project proposes that we start the pavement striping, um, essentially almost, almost where the two lanes begin. So the striping on the, on the road would start to designate that's gonna become a, a trap lane. Um, and then the, there would also be advanced signage. Those are chicken lanes. If you ever play, if you ever see Rebel Without a Cause, it's the chicken run is off the end of the cliff. So we feel like um, with those 
components and the fact that we'll be eliminating the flashing left turn yellow, which is a, a situation that causes many of the accidents in that intersection, mm -hmm. that overall it'll be safer. Flashing yellow, it moves traffic though. It does, but there are a lot of near misses. Yeah, yeah. Um, then we had two questions from uh, Mr. Gifford, a request or a concern about the dual left turn lanes not reducing the traffic volumes on Malala. Um, you can see on the bottom of page three <clears throat> that when we look at the traffic volumes um, that we took in the corridor, that we see 480 vehicles um, that use the Malala corridor that go from Beaver Creek to 213. So they're not making any turns on or off. They're, they're continuing from one end to the other, not stopping at a business, not going home. So essentially cutting down Malala. So by pushing them into that left turn lane and, and using Beaver Creek, we can remove those non-essential trips from that section of the corridor. And, and those kind of things, you know, looking at more um, pedestrian and bike friendly amenities, you know, they're gonna find that although it's a slightly longer trip, it's a faster trip down Beaver Creek in 213. So you're switching them from Malala to Beaver Creek, so they hit the Beaver Creek 213 intersection, which is lousy? The Malala Beaver Creek, um, the 213 and Beaver Creek intersections, movements that fail is the AM peak, so 7 AM to 8 AM northbound from Beaver Creek onto 213 northbound. So that movement Christina mentioned that we've identified a project and we're working to find mm -hmm. funding, that's where the intersection fails in the morning. So that movement and the movement we're pushing people to do not conflict. Um, the PM peak failure of the intersection is southbound on 213, making a left onto Beaver Creek. So that idea, um, essentially to make that work, we need triple lefts, and that's not gonna happen. So some of those trips would get pushed down 213 to Myers, and alleviate, so that's how the Myers Road Project alleviates some of those movements. In the morning, people could choose to cut across Myers and go straight through 213, which is not a movement that fails in the morning. So. They will find their way. Yes. Um, so we feel that it will, we will see reduced traffic volumes on Malala um, because those cut through trips will find that quicker route. And so we've got some of the traffic counts through those intersections there. <clears throat> Hey, Dana. Yes. Well, one thing I'm a little confused is that the whole Malala coming up hill all the way through is, is a one lane in each direction with a turn lane. Then we come there at the that shopping center and it becomes two lanes. And then it's again going down to one lane. I wasn't sure why those lanes, two lanes were there in the first place. And then, I mean, here it says only 364 vehicles is turning, if, uh, if this configuration or orientation is right, onto the Beaver Creek from Malala. Is that the case? On the page, on their page four, Beaver Creek. Is that Be that's Beaver Creek and Malala, right? Yes, these are 2018 peak, PM peak current count. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're trying to move some of those 637 that are going through, 480 of which are going all the way through the corridor to make a left. How many are you trying to move? I'm curious. I don't remember the percentage. Yeah, it's 25%. 25%. 25%. Of those trips that are going through, you want them diverted? Encouraged. Encouraged. Yes. But what if they're not encouraged? If they don't, if they still going straight. We have future encouragements coming. Beaver Creek Corridor will be getting um, traffic signal upgrades that will um, update all the traffic signal um, components and the timing, and they'll be interconnected with fiber. So that's 
little carrot to entice people to use Beaver Creek. I don't know, it seems kind of, if I'm a driver, I, you're almost kind of needing to make this big loop. I mean, the trouble time is not going, but you're not, <coughs> how much time are you really saving, I'm curious. By, by if you hit all three um, pedestrian crossings, when a pedestrian is crossing, you will definitely see time savings going the longer route down How the much? Road. I don't know. 10 seconds, 30 seconds, minute? It's a driver perception. Would you rather be consistently moving or would you rather be stopped at the signal, stopped at the pedestrian crossing, stopped at the signal, stopped behind the bus? I, I know, but we're making these decisions and, and now we're all kind of becoming quasi-stupid. We're punching this and this is telling us kind of where to go and it, it tends to look the stuff and still may be pushing people down the, the corridor. I'm just saying, try to make these improvements, are they truly justified? I mean, Malala just past the intersection only has one lane. It's only three. And so essentially we're just removing that, you know, kind of conflict point right there in front of Marquee where everybody's racing to merge together and get in front of the next guy. So it, it isn't like Malala has any less capacity. It's just we're letting less people in because only one lane's coming through the intersection. Um, it will be interesting to see how it works, performs, I guess. <clears throat> um, the final question from Mr. Gifford was um, suggestion that we drop one of the northbound through lanes at the intersection and shift all the lanes on the north leg to add a dedicated right turn southbound. So essentially the, the adding a right turn lane in front of the bank um, by the Danielsons shopping center um, with the with the pavement we have and only having one northbound lane. And um, you can see in scenario one, which is um, what we're proposing, the, the operations of the intersection, the northbound through and right, and the southbound through and right. Scenario two shows um, one southbound through lane Um, sorry, I'll read my own notes. Um, so there's three scenarios. Mm -hmm. Scenario three is the scenario that uh, Mr. Gifford recommended. And in that situation, the northbound movement fails. So we would be at a situation where we would have, we would have 90 seconds of delay in the northbound direction with a level of service F, which doesn't meet current standards for the signal. So essentially that need for two northbound lanes to get people through that intersection is, is necessary. Where does it fail? It fails, the northbound through lane would fail. If there was only one northbound through lane, it would fail. So his request was to remove one of the northbound through lanes yeah. so that, there, that pavement could be reallocated. Yeah. I understand that, but I'm trying to envision where that would make that intersection fail. Would it be the backup from Moala back toward Fred Meyer? Mm -hmm. You would that, have to wait be a big backup there. point seven seconds to get through the intersection. And in our scenario, you are waiting 44.8 seconds, which is considered acceptable. Um, for the responses to the number of... Uh, wait a minute oops, now. Sorry. Excuse me. This new configuration wouldn't change that backup area at all. No. So why would that be a failed intersection with his suggestion of having a continuation of one northbound line? because you can only get half as many cars through. So you, so right now we have two northbound through lanes. Yeah. And he's asking for us to only have one. Yeah. So the same number of cars would have to get through in one lane. 
So if you're waiting 45 seconds with two at a time, with one at a time, you're going to wait 90 seconds. I, I, I still can't envision the increase in the delay, but that's fine. Let's go ahead. <laughs> you're doubling the traffic and having the area. Yeah, but the traffic northbound that goes through that intersection continues to go straight. But it's in one lane. Is, is in one lane, is already in one lane between uh, Claire Beaver Martin. Creek Road and Fred Meyer. It's all one lane all the way through there, so that amount of traffic wouldn't increase there, thus causing a failure. Uh, that traffic would continue north on one lane as opposed to two lanes that is there now. And as he pointed out, the, that two northbound two lanes only goes for a couple of blocks and then goes back to one lane again. So I, I, I fail to see how that could cause any more of a failure than there already is. So but, right now, um, on the earlier question, we talked about the cycle length. So right now it takes... 110 seconds for everybody to get a turn and you get so many each movement gets so many seconds of green time as we increase that cycle length to 140 seconds everybody gets a little more time but everybody waits a little bit longer and it's that time when that northbound movement has the red and however many seconds that is all those cars start to back up and although traffic's moving down the corridor it's all stopping and if if only one car can get through one lane versus two lanes, that's half as much traffic that gets through. So you're going to start to see that back up. So it's assuming that, that, that uh, there is more traffic than time allowed. Yes, and in your peak times, you'll see that. You'll, you'll see, you'll see, you won't, it'll take the full 140 seconds to cycle through. On off-peak, it'll cycle much faster because it's, it doesn't see the stacking of cars and knows there's people waiting. Plus, you got those receiving, two receiving lanes there where vehicles are continuing and then they're kind of merging, and so you got buffer there. I think we've uh, discussed this one a bit. Okay. Um, a couple more items I wanted to go over um, that are the, kind of the key community concerns from the project. Um, so we heard some concerns about um, public outreach not being broad enough to um, businesses along the corridor. So we've asked our consultant, and during the last week of August and the first week of September, um, they canvassed the corridor. They um, spoke with 75 businesses or tenants along the corridor, so those that do not own the property um, that may not um, have been reached out to related to property acquisition. Um, so they got 53 additional properties to provide email um, contact information so that we can put them on our interested parties list. Um, generally, those properties they spoke with understood the need for the safety improvements and were glad to hear about it. Um, they weren't too concerned with access to their business um, today, but as they think about the project more, um, you know, they want to know more about that. And we did hear from um, some of the larger um, shopping complexes, specifically the South Ridge Center and the, I'm not sure what the little strip mall with Thai Chef and Get and Go Grocery is called, but tenants in both of those um, groupings commented on the high volume and high speeds of the cut through traffic through those drive aisles. Um, so one of the, the key community concerns is um, the pedestrian crossing and the median at the um, South Ridge Center. So for context, um, under, underneath this little pedestrian sign is the Black Rock Coffee. So you've got Wells Fargo Bank, Black Rock Coffee, and over here is Mountain View Apartments. <clears throat> so I have spoke with the property manager for South Ridge Center and um, we've had a conversation about this drive aisle. She was currently working on a proposal to get cost estimates to put in speed bumps because her tenants have been complaining to her about the high speed of the cut through traffic. Um, so when we sat down and kind of talked through this median, she actually thought this might solve her cut through traffic problem. Um, and so the Southridge Center is um, 
you know, interested to see this go in and see if this solves some of their internal um, speeding problems. I've also spoke with um, Mountain View Apartments and they acknowledge that it's, it's generally their tenants that are cutting across the street in that location. Um, and so they support the uh, median and the pedestrian crossing. You will notice that this driveway into their complex is, will become a right in right out due to the median and they believe that the safety impacts of the pedestrian crossing are outweigh the, the limitations for left in and left out at this driveway. And so they will share that information with their tenants um, there. We also um, expect that tenants from the Claremont Mobile Home Park, which is just below the screen here, um, would also use that pedestrian crossing there. Um, I've also spoke with TriMet. Their bus drivers often see pedestrians uh, jetting across the street in an unsafe manner um, and have reported that to TriMet enough that in, in their, um, let's see what the year was, they had a report in, 2012 that looked at um, the Clackamas County Red Soils campus and needs in the area, and they actually identified the need for a um, RRFB or a safe pedestrian crossing in this location back in 2012. And so those, those three groups all support this. Um, I, we feel like this is a good option and we'll be taking this back through a process to take it back to city commission to confirm the median will stay inside the project. Um, this is just kind of that visual that shows all the access points in and out of the shopping center. The, the access directly in front of Goodwill, the sign that says right only will be removed. We feel like it is a safe location to make left at this point. Um, they've got a right in, right out, a signalized intersection. Um, so they've got a lot of access points in there. So it's not, it's not their only driveway we're, we're impacting and, and they um, agree it's a benefit to the corridor. The pedestrian crossing um, kind of in the midway of the project that's currently located at Garden Meadow is proposed to move at this point. Um, this is the post office over here and the fire station. So it kind of goes right in between those. We've worked closely with the fire department they will still have the ability to pull their vehicles that use this station completely within the left turn lane and out of the travel lane. Um, they've got some long vehicles, but in order to make that kind of U-turn, they've got to kind of pull a whole U-turn and wrap around the building anyways. So we've worked closely with them on that. Um, we heard from the community the request to open back up the first street access from behind the post office. We met with the post office, shared this concern, and um, they feel that it's a, a safety concern for their facility to open that back up and have chosen not to open it, even though we've requested that. That's in the post office property. Yes. So they have an access onto First Street that you can get around the back instead of having to come back out onto Malala. Apparently it was maybe open in the past and they closed it. It, it used to be open and they closed it, I think, when they realized it was probably a security concern. Mm. Yeah, um, so I, I did include the location of the south um, pedestrian crossing. Um, we haven't heard too many concerns about this location, um, but since I had the other two, I thought I'd show you. We have um, proposed kind of skewing those so that when the pedestrian gets in the, in the island, as they turn to kind of use the remaining portion of the crosswalk, they would be looking into oncoming traffic. So sort of a skewed, as much as we can with a small um, refuge island. Um, so just trying to add those small details that provide a little more safety. Um, for the gateway, we've moved forward with the basalt seat walls option. So this would include um, short um, seat walls along the sidewalks at the south end near Highway 213. Um, I don't have a slide for this, but the cross street banner um, will be going in um, right across from Sureguard. So right there and on the other side is a residential. Um, and so that's the proposed location for the cross street banner. 
So a little bit on construction impacts. Um, it's a big project. We're, you know, we're working, working through what that looks like from a construction staging standpoint. It is um, a 19 inch deep new roadway section. So, you know, imagine having to dig that out. There's, there's gonna be impacts. Um, every driveway, every street connection, you know, there's gonna be short periods of time um, with side street closures. So we'll have, you know, a period where Gaffney coming onto Malala is closed and we'll be routing people through the neighborhoods to get to Malala either at Claremont or Garden Meadow. Um, so those will happen at each of those connection points as we work through rebuilding the roadway. Um, we will have some areas of the project that have nighttime construction, so not in those areas adjacent to residential, but that area kind of between Claremont and First Street is an area that could see nighttime construction where we don't have residential. Um, we'll have two lanes out there, but there will be times where it'll be flagged one way as we're working in, along there. Um, you know, we'll have access, business access signs out reminding folks that businesses are still open. And um, neighborhood access, yes. Do you think that maybe the post office would be amenable to opening that rear area during the construction in front of their area? That's something we can reach out to them and talk about um, yeah. the, I have met with the fire station. Um, we had some short discussions about if we knew the dates, um, they have, they have um, not that long ago worked out of another station. So if, if we had a specific set of dates, um, they could close the station for 24 hours, locate their equipment off site, and still be able to provide service. So we'll continue to coordinate with them on, on that. And then for a timeline, um, we're currently reviewing the 90% plans. Um, final plans and bidding should be ready, hopefully by January, with construction starting in the spring. And completion? When? Fall? To be determined. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're, we're still, yeah, we're here. still working through that. I mean, ideally, we'd love to get it done in one season, but getting everything done in time to do the <coughs> paving and striping before rain um, could be tough. So as we review the 90% plans and really start to think about what's happening first with the water line and storm line and new curbs and sidewalks, um, we should have a little bit better idea. Thank you. Great. Next. Well done. Oh, uh, Jason. So I'm just going to give a, a quick update on the Kanima family friendly route that we've been working on. We put in uh, 40 stop signs in there, uh, three at Ganong and third, we created a three way stop there. Um, and then one up at Blanchard and fourth. Um, we put in six new uh, 20 mile an hour speed limit signs with the family friendly route, bike rider pedestrian below it. We put in 21 of the uh, thermoplastic bike markings. The plan originally called for um, 33. We omitted 12 for the time being um, to see how the community reacts to it. And if those are necessary, we can put them in. We painted out the bump outs. Uh, we haven't put thermoplastic down yet. There's, there's going to be, we're, we're waiting on that too, to hear more from the community. Um, and then we'll put those in at a later date. So that's where we are on the. Are you through with Kanima? Yep. Paul? I, I am, I am from Kanima and I would like to thank you for some comments. Again, Paul Edgar, uh, Oregon city and Kanima resident. Uh, the, the first thing they did was in Kanima was to put the 20 mile an hour speed signs up. And my God, it's fantastic. Okay, all of a sudden, then they did one other thing like on Fifth Avenue, they uh, put a, a sign there where people could actually see how fast they were moving, radar detection sign. People have slowed down dramatically now that they realize 
that one, the speed limit is 20, but uh, they were really going 30 in the past. Now they see, I can see them come around the corner off of South End Road and, the, and their speed is 25 to 30 miles an hour and then all of a sudden the light flashes on and they, they slam on their brakes, okay? They never did that before, okay? But one of the things that's a real problem is these proposed uh, areas where people, pedestrians or bikers, could come and walk at some of the corners. So there's a couple of them that are really problematic because they put the cars head to head. They direct the cars. We only have 22 feet uh, of, of asphalt. So we may have a big, uh, 60 foot wide easement for the street, but when you get down to a narrow area and you put these areas there, uh, so at South End, or excuse me, at Third Avenue and, and Hedges, drive it, and my recommendation is come to Kanema and drive it. Take a look at it yourself, see what happens. So the citizenry throughout Kanema that I've been talking to and I walk around, talk to them, they're, in total disagreement with how you've got them platted right now, uh, laid out. There's concern that there might be curbs. I said, no, there are not gonna be curbs. But they see this, these lines there and they see how big they are. And they say, well, this doesn't work. I said, tell somebody. Get, your, get, on, the, get on your megaphone and start telling people. All I'm asking for you and I'm asking is for any of you guys, come to Kanema, drive around, take a look at it, see where you are with a car, think about what, what, what actually needs to be there. This is a historic National Register Historic District. And when you start changing our little wagon roads to, to, to do something that is uh, not in the scope of what, what wagon, wagon roads are for, you're really altering and, uh, a, why we exist, why, the, why we're listed as a federal, by the federal government as a historic place and status neighborhood. And so my recommendation is, if I was to say something, is I don't really think we need those, those spaces. And uh, all of us that walk, and I'm a, a daily walker, uh, uh, and I don't see that this is going to accomplish anything. I think it's going to hurt. It's going to, it's putting cars to cars, and I think that there's far more po potential problems there in, in that case. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure that uh, the staff will be looking into it a little bit. Moving on. I have one question just about Kanima. Uh, is there any bike ped counts being done, like manual or using uh, tubes at all to see difference between before and after they're implemented? Not right now, not that I know of. Okay. No. Just want to provide that suggestion. It's good to track data, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so thank you, Jason. You want to move on to street sweepings, please? Okay, so the just a quick overview of uh, the sweeping. We do a street sweeper, we, we run one street sweeper year round. And right now we've added a second one we, every year for leaf season for about three months. Um, to give you an idea of uh, what we do from July 1 of 2018 to June 30 of 2019, um, we uh, swept 1,586 hours of man time sweeping. Um, 8,742 miles, lane miles of road swept. Um, that's 11.7 times around the city. So it's getting about once a month, the whole suite. city's getting swept. Um, 3,366 cubic yards of uh, material was removed from the streets. Um, it comes with a tipping fee, $24,000 to remove that material. Um, if you take the personnel, um, 92,000, the equipment's 189,000, so it's around $300,000 to run sweepers. That's based on what that machine is worth and what the, what the uh, personnel is worth. Um, that's a, just a quick overview of the city's sweeper operations for a year. 
Quick question. So do you, for different zone areas like Main Street or commercial areas, you do those more frequently than once a month or neighborhoods? Zone, yes, zone one, the downtown, that gets swept every other Friday morning. Sweeper operator, she comes in at three o'clock every other Friday morning to sweep the downtown, the Main Street. Um, and you have the zone X, which is the, uh, shows a lot of the main streets, that, that one gets swept more often too. And a lot of times when they're going, sweep operators are going from one area, they might sweep Lynn Avenue, so we have a lot of bike lane, uh, glass in the bike lane, stuff in the bike lane on Lynn Avenue a lot. They, they know where these bike lane issues are and they, they hit those. Thank you. Jay, Jason, a suggestion would be to put out in September, October of each year, the uh, policy on leaf pickup in the streets for the city has. Uh, I noticed that uh, there are people around who sweep all their stuff in the street and make a nice pile and expect the street sweeper to pick it up. Yeah, the, you're correct about that. We have put it uh, in the, uh, what's the, we put it on the city website. Yeah. It went I'm sure everybody website. sees that. Yeah, and Kristen Brown, our PIO, has done social media yeah. posts uh, yeah. with, with that message. Yeah, I was, mm -hmm. I was thinking maybe something stuck in the water bill would be more effective. Yeah, I something know. like this. Uh, uh, this is very eye-catching. Mm -hmm. It came in the, in the mail, so with the bill. So if you added something about leaves, mm -hmm. once here. Well, I'll definitely take that under advisement, yeah. That's all I got. Great. That's all right, Dana. Um, we wanted to make sure you guys were aware of an opportunity um, coming up on October 22nd from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Abernathy Center. Metro is hosting a, they refer to it as hashtag get moving 2020. Um, it's a transportation forum. So if you haven't heard, Metro is proposing a November 2020 transportation funding ballot measure that would fund a, a group of projects. Um, I'd, it would support um, and fund the local share for the um, Southwest Corridor Max extension. Um, and to go with that project, they are identifying um, a number of corridors that include projects. So right now, the five possible corridors in Clackamas County are the Sunrise <clears throat> um, Gateway, a, a kind of a phase two of the Sunrise Corridor um, that Clackamas County is um, sharing, um, a Clackamas to Columbia, which is a roadway that kind of takes you from Happy Valley into Gresham and looking kind of at increasing that north-south connectivity. Uh, McLaughlin Boulevard that runs um, from uh, Portland to Oregon City, 82nd Avenue and the Oak Grove Lake Oswego Pedestrian Bicycle Bridge. Um, so in your packet is what, I think it's called the McLaughlin One Pager. So what the proposal would be for the McLaughlin Corridor, if it's selected to be part of the bond measure, um, and that's kind of what Metro is looking for feedback on is which of these corridors do they see local support for. Um, so that McLaughlin Boulevard is looking, is kind of being proposed as an enhanced transit corridor. So it would start in downtown Milwaukee, include um, transit prioritization at signals. They would be looking at some business access transit lanes on those on that really wide section of McLaughlin where they can allocate some of that pavement to facilitate quicker, better um, transit service. They kind of tout it as a rubber tired extension of the orange orange line. So it would go from the, that Park Avenue end of the orange line all the way to the Oregon City Transit Center. Um, so we, we would see better transit service um, both to Oregon City um, but also connecting to the future Riverwalk and Legacy Willamette Falls project. Um, some of the other things that um, kind of show on the, the second page of that corridor in the Oregon City area, um, we've been continuing to advocate that, you know, transit is a great thing, but in order to entice all voters, 
Um, there needs to be a little bit of vehicle capacity projects. So included in that is um, the ability to construct the dual left turn lanes. Um, so 99E southbound, there's currently one left turn lane onto 205 southbound and one left turn lane onto 205 northbound. Both of those um, single left turn lanes need to be dual left turn lanes in order to address the, the Q spillback that we see at those left turns. The pavement width is actually there under the 205 bridge. You'll, you'll notice there's kind of that really wide shoulder. Um, so that's the pavement that it would allow that to happen. In order to implement that, we need wider on-ramps and um, some changes to some signal equipment. So those are, those are pretty big projects um, in the five to $10 million range to implement both of those. There's a large um, sign bridge with the signal equipment that needs to be moved. Um, along with that would be better bike and ped um, amenities under the 205 crossing. So between those ramps where there's, I don't even know if it's a real sidewalk or more of a, a dirt trail that people have made, um, we would look at rebuilding the 99E northbound right turn lane onto 205 northbound. So it's right now it's really designed to be a fast movement for a vehicle which is not safe for bike and ped. So we would look to rebuild that to current standards that provide a safer situation for bike and, pe bike and peds, excuse me. <clears throat> and then um, we've also included some preliminary design work on what we refer to as the Willamette Falls shared use path. So that um, extension of the, the Willamette Terrace and that, that nice sidewalk we have from, you know, connecting from around 15th down to 10th um, it kind of ends there. And if you've ever walked along 99E there, it, it's, 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 it is a sidewalk. It's, it's maybe four and a half, five feet wide with a um, non-code meeting railing between yourself and the river and an 11 foot travel lane, which means if a large truck is driving by with a, a large mirror, hopefully you're walking against traffic and can see him coming. Um, it's, not, it's not a great sidewalk. So this would provide funding to look at how do we get um, the 2005 McLaughlin Enhancement Plan talked about a 17 foot wide sidewalk. So how do, we, how do we move forward on getting that sidewalk there? So that's a little bit about kind of the pieces in um, Oregon City, but the invitation is there to attend the meeting and provide your feedback to Metro so they can identify those corridors and move that forward. Next. All right. Got just a few items. I'll make it quick. Quick. I will wrap it up. So as an FYI for you folks, um, October 19th, Center Street between 7th and 8th is going to be temporarily closed for John McLaughlin's 235th birthday. So just want to make you aware of that closure. I believe coming? it is on our <laughs> website also. What's that? Yes. Is he coming? <laughs> He's already He's there. there. Well, it's not quite Halloween, so maybe not. <laughs> He's not that far away. That's right. And then uh, basically my next items are to let you know what's coming up for November. Okay. Uh, we've talked uh, at several meetings about the uh, road safety audit that we hired DKS to perform on Malala and Pearl. Uh, we recently got the draft from DKS. Um, I reviewed it. Dana reviewed it. Uh, uh, Bicker and Carl at the county reviewed it, made some notes. DKS is currently incorporating those notes and, and items that they've identified. Lacey Brown, who is a traffic engineer that worked on this project uh, with DKS, she is going to be here in November for our November TAC meeting to give a, a, an in-depth presentation on their findings. The findings, in a nutshell, are going to include certainly a summary of the intersection, uh, crash histories, short-term recommendations that can be made, some long-term safety improvements with some prioritization and cost assessed, uh, estimates associated with that. So uh, we're very excited to have, have this almost wrapped up. And uh, again, she's gonna come do a presentation for you in November on that, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, we recently received uh, the <clears throat> application from some residents that live on uh, Barlow Drive off Holcomb. They're interested in having speed hump. And I think it's one speed hump, Jason, or two? Yeah. Just uh, 
just one speed hump. So um, we are going to present that to you in November also. John has been communicating with the residents, as has Jason. Uh, I would expect, uh, because these folks are fairly passionate about the speed hump, they want to see it go through, that they'll be here at that November meeting. Um, part of the process for speed humps is for the, the TAC board to take a look at it and analyze it and basically give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Okay. Will funding be discussed? Funding is discussed, and the funding comes from the property owners. Yes. So when, when that is uh, scheduled, can we make sure that there is not going to be another long presentation there with it? Well, I'll be giving the presentation, and you know me, I, I'll keep it pretty short. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really more just, you know, I'll uh, um, have all these documents scanned so you folks can see them prior to the meeting. They'll ha you'll have them in front of you. Um, we had the uh, speed trailer out there. It has some very interesting data on uh, the 85th percentile speeds, maximum speeds, things like that. They're very low, very low. But um, at any rate, I want to let you know that's coming. Speed humps, uh, from my understanding, are actually pretty rare here. Uh, John was telling me that it's been quite a long time since anybody's applied for a speed hump or that the uh, TAC board in the city has agreed to have one in. So, and then finally, um, Kelly Reed in planning wanted me to just kind of mention uh, what the TDM, the Transportation Demand Management Group, has been working on. So if, if, if I may, I'm just going to read this very quick email that she sent me with some bullet points. Uh, the TDM Working Group will be rolling out the Downtown Travel Behavior Survey later this month. The goal is to find out how people, are, how people get to downtown, what mode of transportation they use, how they park, and the purpose of their trip. They are aiming to get 75% or more of all people who work downtown to take the survey, along with a good sample of visitors and customers. They will be asking people questions about their perceptions of safety and convenience uh, when they're traveling downtown as well. The TDM group is working with Rick Williams Consulting on this survey, who helped create the TDM plan and our downtown parking study. The survey will be repeated in 2021 and in future years so we can compare results over time. Uh, Kelly will send a link that I will make sure you folks get um, to the survey when it's available and so you can take the survey or send it to anyone you know who lives or works or goes downtown. And uh, also in November, I'm not sure if it's going to be Kelly, it could be Liz Hannum with DOCA, the Downtown Oregon City Association. They're going to give a short talk about uh, their pedestrian count, uh, as you were, pedestrian counter that they have. And, it has, and how it pertains uh, to the survey work. And that's all I have. Thank you. Communications, anything? I have one item. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Park Place Neighborhood Association is still eagerly awaiting communications from staff in regard to Holcomb Boulevard crosswalks. Um, again, we're asking to have the priority bumped up uh, last week, one of our steering committee members almost got struck at exactly at one of those proposed intersections by two vehicles passing another vehicle on the right. And she and her dog had to jump into the ditch to get away from being struck. And uh, I don't know how much a crosswalk at that location, which is already planned in the TSP, would have helped, but just a little mm -hmm. something that we need those crosswalks out there like everybody else has throughout the city. I think there's something you want to think about. Yes. Yeah. Dana, Bob, Dana, and I will certainly look at that and uh, uh, be able to report back to you if, if, at least our progress where we're at on that at the next meeting. Thank and, you. And, and we. We might just give you a hauler offline too. To I, I might because again, uh, still being quasi new here to the city, I'm still kind of learning my way around town. I, I, I certainly know where Holcomb is, but I might like to see just just where your idea for the sidewalks are, or where uh, some of your neighbors have indicated, uh, just for my own benefit, so I can be out there in the field and take a look. Sure, yeah, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. 
I, I recommend that, that, that this committee uh, uh, go on record in some way to, su to support, like, as in support of, of the, moving this priority up. Thank you. Is there anybody willing to make a motion to that? I, I make that motion. Anybody for a second? I'll second it. All in favor <laughs> say aye. 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 We all support moving it up. All right. That sounds good. Thank you. I just have uh, one announcement with uh, the Get There Challenge going on right now until I think next Monday. And with that, it's a statewide challenge to get people to use, uh, not drive alone basically. It, it gets me uh, carpool, van pool, use transit, bike walk. And telework as well. Uh, and there's go to get there, Oregon .org, and there's also an app they can use to track your uh, ride or your trips. Uh, and there's prizes, uh, including grand prizes. So just wanted to promote that if that's out there, and um, it's a pretty cool opportunity. And allows you also do carpool matching. So if you're trying to find a carpool, you can use this app and website to find a carpool. I just a quick. Uh... Myers Road extension, I've seen a lot of earth moved. Do you plan to have that potentially paid before winter hits or not? <laughs> no. I don't think so. No. Completion of Myers Road, um, where BPA is still um, on schedule to raise the tower, re relocate and raise the tower in June of 2020. Uh, we can't complete um, the hard surfaces under that under those lines until after the tower's been raised. Okay. So as soon as BPA is done, the contractor can be set loose to kind of finish up that sidewalk and pavement. Um, but we want one continuous top lift to pavement. So there is a chance um, it might be done in fall of 2020, but it might be spring of 2021 and it'll be weather dependent. So not, not, yeah. not this year. It's nice to see a lot of things happening. A lot of big rocks. Yeah, so they are still working. So right now, um, the, they'll start, I think next week, um, connecting to the water and the sewer out in Highway 213. So there'll be some um, traffic impacts um, in the evenings after, I think ODOT's allowed work after 7 p.m. Um, so those connections to the water and sewer will happen out in 213. And then over the winter, they'll be installing the, um, first they'll start with the sanitary sewer line um, because it's a gravity line. There's a section where the road kind of comes up and that, that sewer line is 25 feet deep. Um, and we do anticipate some rock. So it, it, they'll spend the winter um, getting that gravity sanitary sewer line in and then they'll start um, water once they're complete with the sewer. So they'll still continue to work over the winter. It'll just be a little bit slower pace while they're digging that 25 foot trench yeah. in rock. There will be some, they hauled a lot of rock, big yeah. rock. Yeah, yeah. so big they've been, big so, they've, rocks. so they've graded the roadway. Um, that berm will start to come down. So as you're driving on 213 and you see that berm, that's gonna, mm. that's gonna come down. Um, but yes, they've brought in the rock to protect the road grade. Well, it took a lot of it. They found a lot of big rocks. Yeah. Yes, and I think they've got a little pile there. Yeah. We're working on ways to address the rocks. <laughs> and it, I, I have one item that hasn't got an answer, so I don't expect an answer. But is it should be considered on projects, private projects, it seems, on main arterials, main streets. There should be some way of getting a completion date done on them. Um, I'm thinking of the sewer line connecting that new building by the St. John's Church that's been having a, a steel plate on, the, on Center Street now for about three months over a mm -hmm. sewer line connection that should have been done in a week. And also I'm thinking of the sidewalk that went around the ur new ur urgent care facility at um, Milne, huh? or, Malala or and Warner Milne. Uh, yeah, Warner. Malala and Warner Milne, where Warner. they could have cut down the wait time from a month 
if they'd used high early cement instead of ordinary cement in the sidewalk construction. And so it, and we could have gotten the, the traffic congestion out of there three weeks sooner maybe, or more. And I know it would take a code change to make that happen, but I think it should be considered. And if there's, if there's nothing else, We'll stand adjourned. You guys, I... Mm -hmm.